Hi everyone, and welcome to Nomensa's first webinar of 2021. Uh, rest assured, this is the first of many webinars and virtual events we'll be hosting this year, um, including World IA Day Bristol, which I'm pleased to announce we'll be hosting on the 27th of February. Um, we're going to be tweeting out some details about that shortly, so please keep an eye on our social channels for how to register for that. Um, today's session, though, is hosted by our Head of Design, Will Wellesley Davis, uh, titled Humanising the Design of Digital Local Government Services. It does pretty much what it says in the tin. Um, we'll cover points such as uh, how do you address inconsistencies across websites, um, how do you design systems to cope with diverse service offerings, uh, and how do you engage users and build trust across across diverse communities and much more. Um, please do get involved and say hello to each other in the chat. Uh, make sure that you've got your chat settings switched to panelists and attendees. So. Everyone can see your messages um, and do let us know uh, if there are any issues with the stream. Um, also, please do ask us some questions using the Q&A box. Um, I'll try and get through as many of those as I can at the end. Um, uh, we will also be um, sharing a recording of this to um, everyone that views and everyone that's signed up um, straight after the session today. Um, we are using Rev for auto-generated closed captions. Um, whilst these are accurate, it does sometimes get a few words muddled. Um, uh, we'll, when we make this publicly available on, on our YouTube channel, we will make sure these are 100% accurate. So please do bear with us um, on that. Um, so yeah, that, that's all the housekeeping done. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Will to kick things off. Thank you very much and, uh, and welcome to my webinar. Um, so humanizing the design of digital local government. Um, so as Henry sort of said, I, I'm going to be looking at sort of covering a couple of topics around the sort of some of the science, the psychology of uh, how our emotions work and how we use our emotions in our, our decision making in, in sort of design uh, and services. They're going to look at some of the processes we can use to uh, help organize and influence that type of design difference. Uh, and then I've pulled together some of the examples of the work we've been doing. Um, and some of the sort of uh, detours, some of the mistakes, uh, some of the learnings that we've gained uh, in some themes um, that I can share with you and hopefully stimulate a little bit of discussion and uh, show some sort of generosity in, in sharing our approach to humanizing design. So a little bit about me. Uh, what do I know about design? So I've been in design for sort of 25 years. Um, I started my career in the BBC. Uh, I spent about six years uh, working in digital, um, where the mantra was to inform, entertain and educate. And actually that's stead me in really good, um, good place over the years, because actually that's a really good way to get people's attention, provide value uh, and, and to get a really good response to them. And whilst at the BBC, the, the sort of ethos was to really uh, encourage people to, to produce content that could reach out and reach everyone. Uh, and that's something I've, I've sort of taken on board throughout my career. Um, I've led teams across uh, in digital agencies and, and work client side as well. So I've, I've got that understanding of, of the different types of cultures, um, you know, both sort of take on a challenge and, and sort of go headstrong with a, a sort of dedicated team, but also work with a team sort of working the long term approach, uh, keeping sort of business as usual working. Uh, and across my career, I worked across a number of industries, you know, from media, telecoms, uh, through to sort of finance uh, and into government uh, and local authorities. So that full range helps to sort of inspire that constant sense of learning that you require in design. So where do we start with uh, human-centered design? Um, design for sort of being human-centered is about putting people at the heart of it. Um, like Henry said, it, it says what it does on the tin. But actually, when we look at how people respond, that can get quite complicated. And, you know, when we think about people's emotional needs and their capabilities, they're very varying. Um, we can tend to come to situations, the same situation, but with different types of states of emotion. Um, and we know that we all have different types of capabilities, whether it's uh, I wear glasses, you know, others don't. You know, some people have much more different types of needs that require different types of technologies to support them. Um, so when we talk about human-centered design, it's about putting people first. As I said, it's about sort of understanding emotions. Um, and emotions aren't that easy to, to sort of play with, but there are ways we can 
kind of deconstruct that. Um, so we have parts of it are going to be subconscious reactions and others are going to be more conscious. And these aspects are important to consider when we come to designing solutions in a digital space. Um, on the left here, we've got a kind of explanation of um, the sort of different types of uh, our, our kind of reactions to sort of uh, emotions. So we have the sort of visceral one. These are our sort of more automatic reactions, our instincts. Um, that branding tend to play with. These are sort of responses to things like color. Um, so we all know that sometimes red is danger. We use it for traffic lights to stop. Uh, whilst green is a, a progressive color, something to sort of go, it becomes healthy, it's positive. Um, these sort of attitudes, these beliefs, these feelings are deep rooted and, and we're unconsciously responding to them in our responses to design. And in the middle, we've got these sort of behavioral designs um, this is really the, the sort of functional, the usability aspects uh, of design. And it's the pleasure we get when something just works as we sort of expected it. We didn't consciously sit there, I wonder how this would work. We tend to do it a bit more sort of instinctively and then it, it draw, drives a certain, a certain amount of pleasure. And then we have the reflective part of the design. This is where we sort of actually consciously look back and think that was a pleasurable process um, this is an experience that I have gained value from. And we begin to sort of use that sort of emotional intelligence to assess a value. And we know that positive uh, experiences and emotions will give, a, give us a way of holding that information for longer. So when we look at the value of these types of emotions, um, we can begin to think about, about why this is so important in designs and services. Um, so people trust people more than machines, sounds obvious. Um, but if we don't want a machine to behave like a machine, we need to bring in <coughs> more sort of humanity in the process. Um, when people speak, um, we like to respond better when people speak the types of language that we speak, not just language, but vocabulary. Uh, if we use complicated words, we tend to sort of struggle to understand. Um, and as I talked about where we have positive experiences, that will help our memories last longer. And actually it'll inspire us to share that memory. So we become more advocates. So if we want to grow a service, we want to encourage more people to use it, we want people to come back and use it again. These are important factors to build into the way we work. And of course, this isn't particularly new. Um, and I, when I was looking back at, it's not really a timeline of where it started, but certainly with um, humanizing technology, Apple were one of the innovators where they brought a personality to the screen. Um, just the simple word of hello. Um, and then all the design that they put into their interface made a difference and brought technology to the home to, to sort of individual users. Um, and when I was doing my research, it sort of coincided with the Barcelona Olympics. And I thought, actually, that's something I remember from my childhood. Um, and there was a little mascot um, that was part of it. And this again demonstrates this sense of how to get people's emotions connected with a, a sort of business. And of course, over time, that's become much more sophisticated. Um, so we bring you up right up to speed. I just picked an example using Loaf. This is a, a furniture brand, but it's brought together a whole much more sophisticated sort of tone of voice, uh, a use of language uh, and a use of function. So you have both the emotion in the context of where their products sit and how that changes and benefits your, your lifestyle but also on their website, they have lots of functions that help you calibrate and uh, set up the different fabrics and cushions and all the details. So users are getting much more sophisticated in their expectations for how sites can be more personalized. So when we reflect back on local government, um, it, it, I always find it fascinating that when you think of the range of services that local government support, it, it's staggering. The, the sort of local governments, councils, they support sort of the residents uh, in almost all eventualities of life, you know, from the very trivial, the annoying, like a parking ticket or trying to replace a bin, all the way through to sort of serious, significant life events from births, marriages, deaths, um, and everything in between. And so all of the community will have different uh, events, and different emotions they bring to it. And so it becomes really important and nonetheless uh, more, made more relevant in the past year from the, the pandemic and, and the shift of emphasis in terms of the, the digital services 
come into the forefront and our, and our complete dependency in some ways uh, on some of those areas. So a lot of the time we tend to think, where do we start? Um, it, it's a, at a point which it challenges a lot of different organizations. Um, and actually when it's worth sort of stepping back and thinking that to sort of improve humanizing design, it, it's about changing a process. Uh, it's about actually involving more people, more listening, um, and working in a more collaborative approach. And there's often this sort of phrase of everyone can design. I'd quite like to add as a designer that not everyone is a designer, but actually as a, a collaboration, we can collectively improve design. So a human-centered human design process uh, involves this sort of cycle. Um, we start with research to understand the context of our users. Where are they? What are they trying to do? What are, what are the sort of goals they're trying to achieve? Um, and we use techniques in research around observation, watching what people do, because they don't always say what they're doing. Um, we use interviews, workshops, the whole plethora of research techniques we can use to understand. And it's important when we talk about people, I'm trying to avoid using the word user sometimes, but when we talk about the people involved, it includes the staff, the counselors, uh, contractors, businesses, as well as residents uh, and the business and visitors in that kind of community. And with that understanding from research, we can then begin to specify a little bit more about users' needs. Um, this allows us to start channel a kind of better direction into driving the, the design of the solution. And once we've designed the solution, it's important to try and evaluate that, to sort of bring it to people again and test it and understand how their responses are. And in turn, that can then feed back into our research. Um, so, and this can be done at every different level. You know, we can do it at a high level in a sort of discovery project where it's sort of almost hypothesis. Um, we can bring it down into prototypes. Um, we can then bring it into the sort of operations so that the process of evaluation can be in a live environment and the analytics can start to feed the research. Another way of trying to, to get some sort of grasp on the, on the sort of landscape of um, digital experiences and how to humanize them and what's involved is, is to sort of look at this little diagram I put together where if we look at the experience as a whole, we tend to frame experiences with information architecture. It's sort of the structure of information that can inform navigation uh, and, and what, how to find information. And then within that, we have a sort of a systemized approach to design. Um, within a design system, we can then have branding styles that can be applied across your components. Components can build up to make your patterns and those can inform your templates. And then guiding this, we have the governance of content and design guidelines. Um, and I think we're finding it equally helpful nowadays to build a resource, a sort of visual library to, to feed the, the sort of flexibility of your, your sort of service. And then all of that allows you to sort of build that connection between your sort of residents at one side and the staff at the other. So I've got some examples to sort of walk through sort of some of the interesting challenges and then some of the processes we've been through um, and uh, to sort of give you a flavor of some of the sort of outputs. Um, so the first question I had was sort of how do you design a digital space? We often talk about digital design, the designer service, but actually when we look at local government, um, council services, it, it sort of parallels to some of the sort of civic buildings. These are, uh, are sort of spaces which you then run and manage services through them. You know, people come to a website, find the service they need and take the channel they want. Um, so in a way, it's a little bit like interior design. Um, if you think about how, let's say a hospital might divide space up, you know, we use things like color and form to distinguish different functional spaces. So the difference between the corridor and a sort of breakout space is, is helped managed by those things. We use color in this sense for maybe showing a relationship with objects or setting out a tone and a mood for the area. It's there to relax, it's there to have fun, to sort of break away from perhaps the more serious aspects of elsewhere in that, that space. This is just some um, workings that one of my team are looking at with using color in layouts to help sort of frame, to work with different types of content, uh, to provide focus in different aspects of the content, uh, or to help shape sort of differences within uh, navigation. 
So color becomes quite an important part in how we turn, tend to manage the digital spaces that uh, sites build. But colors, as we sort of know, that it can get quite complicated. And I thought I'd share a little bit about a kind of color journey. Colors have meanings, um, but they, they can have politics. And actually, most importantly, with web designers, we want to improve accessibility. So we have to balance these sort of um, competing factors sometimes. Um, we did some work with uh, Brent up in London. Um, part of our design researchers will reach out and understand what are the offline presentations of their brand? What are the kind of what content are they using on and offline? How are they presenting their brand? And then how does that reflect with the community and the stories and the information they're talking about? So you get this full understanding of how the digital space will integrate um, with their with their site uh, with their services. And when we come to colors with accessibility, um, as GovUK do some brilliant work in terms of understanding and testing really robust sort of uh, usable elements uh, and usable patterns that we can we can lift. And what we've been doing in some of our design processes is referencing that type of grounded usability and seeing how can we bring that to a, a new color palette with a council and bring some personality with it, but but still help it be effective and to the sort of WCAG guidelines so that it is accessible and it supports the states it needs. Um, and in one of the early iterations we did with um, Brent is they were interesting because they, they were very keen to sort of avoid bright red and blue and to some degree green because they didn't want to be too associated with some of the politics. And my team got carried away with some very sort of ethnic colors and sort of vibrant colors that related to some of the uh, research from the community. And we came up with this idea of using purple and it seemed to work really well with some of the, the other colors until we suddenly realized it, it looked quite UKIP. So sometimes it's quite, quite hard to sort of find the sort of the right gaps in between some of these um, sort of political landmines. Um, but it's part of the process to test that out, share it, allow people to see it. Um, so in the end for Brent, we ended up with a sort of more muted sort of green and blue color. And it's important for this, we were looking to try and create quite a, a calm environment. We wanted a, a neutral set of colors that would support the legibility and the accessibility of key colors for links and buttons. Um, we also wanted to use those colors as backdrops, as page divides, and help work with different types of content, whether it was vibrant and colorful or whether it was quite muted and, and serious. Working with Brent, we also found that a sense of uh, belonging was a really important feature. Um, councils represent communities and communities have a pride for where they are. Um, and that might include landmarks or culture, uh, all sort of activities that might happen in that local area. And that was an important part to reflect in the spaces we create that support the services. Um, so for Brent, when we looked at some of their local landmarks, and they've got some impressive ones, and, you know, apart from the obvious ones of, of Wembley, um, they've got some amazing temples and, and other, again, locally interesting architecture. I'm not saying it's the best as, as such, but it's, these are things that people recognize from their own area. And by translating those into these illustrated shapes that we could then feed into page dividers and footers was a nice way to help reflect the kind of local area, allow people to have that sort of little, little dopamine of, of sort of recognizing their own area and getting a sense of belonging. Um, and then part of these illustrations we developed at a, a kind of quite a kind of flexible vector format. So they become jigsaw puzzle pieces we can rearrange and, and use differently across the templates. And here are just a couple of examples of how we threaded them into the, the footer on different types of pages against okay, different colors. Now we probably all recognize this is a wonderful building over in, in Prague and I, I kind of put it in there because it kind of represented this sense that design over time can get messy. We, we all build, if we manage something for long enough, there will be bits that started off fresh and new, but as we use it, as we update it and change it, um, standards change, um, different people, it can easily get messy and perhaps that's normal. Um, and I think this is just a reflection of this is the way technology can change 
um, and we change the standards that we want to, to meet. But it emphasizes the importance to sometimes have outsiders kind of give you some visit visibility back in of what does that mean to your users? I think sometimes when we're looking out of the building, we don't know what people see from the outside. Um, so just again, reiterating the importance of using research to come back and understand if a user comes across one part of the site to develop and follow through a certain service and then goes to another and it is completely different. What impact does that have on their experience? You know, how can we address that? Some of the projects we've been working on, we've also been reaching out to other councils um, to sort of see what their experience is. And again, that's brought back some really interesting feedback. Um, and this one I thought would be relevant where the GDS uh, government's uh, design services have created a really wonderful kind of very practical sort of utilitarian set of design patterns that help usability and accessibility. But if we only use that for a local authority, then actually what we're finding is that it can strip away some of the personality. It becomes less human. Um, and I, that was a really interesting learning from, from another council, um, learning that actually, again, the needs of the council to promote the personality, the uniqueness of that area for commercial use. I wonder how much influence that has on that sense of identity and belonging as well to the residents. And so it's interesting to see that we've got to see the different perspectives to understand the value of the design and how to meet them. An interesting exercise in this sort of space is, is sometimes when reflecting on what kind of site we want to have is, is, is think about our own sites as a friend and think, well, what personality would it have? Um, you know, is it gonna be helpful, practical or, or thoughtful? Um, and, and that starts to give you a, a kind of a way of looking at the personality of your site and how to start to sort of direct the, the design of it. And design often, often starts from the inside. It's about the discussions we have about the services. It becomes the strategy, the content strategy, and, and to some degree, some of the brand identity and how all that comes together to reflect the services you're offering out. And these characters we've got here are actually part of some work we did with Brent where we were developing some personas. And initially we started putting personas in that had uh, photos. But photos become very kind of fixed. Um, and when we're talking about different people with different capabilities, slightly different needs and emotions, it, it isn't just one person. We want to think a little bit more laterally um, and open up that thought process. And using illustration is actually a really clever way to get people to, to interpret differently and interpret a slightly broader understanding of some of the interesting aspects of how a persona would work. Um, and so these characters actually challenge the, some of the sort of bias we often have in terms of what do people look like. Um, and it challenges some of the, the shapes, the abilities, the, the behaviors of those individuals and helps relate them into these personas so that they can have a, a broader appeal and, and help that process of some of the design decisions. And I mentioned bias, because again, that is inherent in a lot of the things we do. Um, bias is, can be institutionalized. It can be, uh, when we don't challenge bias, it can allow other existing bias to sort of carry on. Um, and that's quite interesting when it comes to things like icons. Um, and I've been very aware of this for some time where when we look at libraries of icons that sit on these uh, websites where we can kind of pull off a whole range of library uh, items, um, you know, we look at the big institutions like Google and others where, you know, they've got the set standard uh, one size fits all type of icons and it does improve efficiencies and consistency, but actually that starts to work against some of the sort of bias that are, are kind of left unchallenged uh, and none more so than addressing people in, in the way we present icons. Um, and often when we start researching icons, we start with this sort of approach where we gather together how all the different colorful variations of icons and some of the bad practices of uh, here as working with Walsall, we sort of found places where the same icons used for different types of services. So what, what do they actually mean? Um, we've got different styles. Um, and you know, these are the general design patterns that you'd want to try and address and make more consistent. 
But what's important when we come to reflecting people is does it reflect people? Um, people are not all one size or one shape. Um, and I, I'd recommend this lady, Jennifer um, Eberhardt. Uh, she's a professor on race and equality. And if you Google her, she's got some very powerful speeches about how if you leave these biases unchallenged, then you, you're kind of contributing to an ongoing factor where we're just sort of trying to represent people in one size um, when that's just not true. So we've been working with uh, we'll sort of look at different shapes and, and line marks to sort of help reflect a variety of, uh, of different diversity in their community. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. So once we've sort of addressed some of the sort of icon libraries, as I said, you know, it's useful to then sort of set out some guidelines um, so that these sort of libraries can live uh, effectively with internal design teams so that they can extend them, but extend them in the right way. Um, and the outcome is that, that can provide a much more efficient way for people to quickly identify the types of services they need. Um, and again, this is important to relate to the right types of labeling. So we mentioned before about language and vocabulary. Um, getting that right with your icons is an, an important part of helping those work together. So how do we share the sort of sum of the parts? Um, you know, sharing, we've been through a number of different sort of samples of different types of engaging with a more humanized approach to space uh, and symbolism. And when we look at how we pull that together, we need to think about the sort of systemization of design, um, design systems. And we talk about this 80-20 rule and design systems represent a way of helping consolidate the variety of templates you might have and see how they can relate to one or two templates. Um, we can then decide how we can sort of have one way to capture an address, one way to present um, some opening times. Um, so we can begin to be a bit more intelligent about how we represent different types of designs um, and pull them into this uh, design system. And these could be kind of formal or informal, um, but generally, as I said before, they kind of have a branded element of styles. Um, we have the components that provide the kind of raw component uh, functionality, like a drop down, a sort of date picker uh, field. And then we have the design patterns. Again, we can look at efficiencies using gov.uk or people like um, NHS Digital have some great patterns and, and bring some inferences from those. So we've got common patterns that are familiar across government services, but begin to understand how we present them in the character and personality of your site. Um, and this comes through and helps us guide the way templates work. When we look at design systems, there are sort of other influences that, that we need to consider, the sort of other dependencies. Um, we talked a little bit about Gov UK, if that's a reference, or W3C standards. Um, but we've also been working with different types of technical developer frameworks. So, for example, Bootstrap's one, where it provides you a, a kind of technical framework of design that allows you to support multiple uh, viewpoints um, for sort of mobile, tablet, and desktop. Um, and again, all of this helps to um, make your whole experience slightly more sophisticated to respond in, in this more complex kind of world that our users uh, demand from us. And some of this approach in terms of how do we take on board a design system and why it's it kind of reminded me of the, the George Clark program of Ugly House. And as I said, it's difficult sometimes. Sites do evolve. They evolve at different times. It can get a bit messy. Um, it's the same in architecture. Over time, changes happen and they, they, they end up looking a little bit unshapely. And just like in, in, a, in a George Clark type program, often he'll understand the, the sort of the way people live in a space, the way they want to live their lifestyles, what their sort of style and personality is. And so there's another way of summarizing that approach of that um, human centered design uh, process to then come up with a better system of applying that to the work, to, to the the site you're running. Often when we look at sort of design systems, we do this evaluation process. So we might tend to do an audit or a kind of review of the sites. Um, and it's, it's another nice way to reflect, um, again, what your site looks like. It, often we don't tend to compare one aspect of the site with another. And yet that's how residents and our users tend to experience sites. Um, their needs vary and will jump between different services. And so it's important to um, 
collate that type of experience to start to see and sometimes share internally that difference and the challenges. And it's quite a good way to help motivate the importance of change. You know, there's four different types of form layouts. There's three different types of way of mapping information. Um, if I look at this information on a mobile, it just doesn't work. Um, so it's important reflecting that back to our internal teams. We've mentioned this a few times, but uh, obviously the, there are design systems um, out there that we can reference and utilize, and they demonstrate great examples of good sort of typographic scales, consistency of, of sort of ways to collect information and represent accessible colors. And um, so those play a part to sort of work. And especially with the local government where you're looking to, albeit provide a more personalized, uh, more localized experience for your community and the way you are, but you also want to um, have a bridge of experience that makes sense that when you look for, let's say, a blue badge parking ticket, type, uh, parking permit, then obviously that's something which central government might do. And so the journey starts on a local authority, but will move out into a, a sort of more um, national government process. So it's important that, that the styles of design are smooth enough that they can work together and they've created a jarring experience. So this is just a couple of examples where we've been blending that kind of mixture of influences um, from different design patterns to produce something for, for Brent. And you know, it allows us to start creating a much calmer way of organizing information. It becomes clearer to navigate information on a page as we jump from one page to another, the patterns are familiar. So I don't have to relearn how to find information on a page. It's following the same process. Um, I can begin to thread through these visual elements so I feel familiar. Um, it helps me focus on the different tasks the page are offering uh, and becomes a much nicer experience for me to want to come back and, and revisit. And when we look at some of the sort of raw elements of design systems, um, typography is a key aspect. Um, we talk about type scale sometimes, which sounds a bit complicated and sometimes it is, um, but it helps us to organize information so there's a clear priority of importance. So people can scan information quickly, clearly see what the primary header is, scan through the headings, and then dip into the, the piece of information they need. And that scale with uh, design frameworks can help that same principle of design efficiency and performance work on all sorts of different types of um, devices. So to see it on a mobile, the type scale will change in, in accordance to, to that device. Uh, and this is just some examples where we've been using kind of patterns. So we talk about sort of, if we have an article, can we have a page that's just got clear guidance of some quick links to jump down that page? Is there a, a constant, a consistent pattern of how to share related links that could be curated to this piece of content? How do we pull out quotes that help sort of break up the page and, and make information easier to read and so on. And so these components we want to use consistently across different types of content, whether it's a, a news article or a service information, uh, a consultation. Um, we want to have these sort of raw elements of uh, experience in a way that are, are, are usable and friendly to, to the user um, to, have to relearn things as they explore the site. And with, with this, we can also build in richer elements. We talked about uh, councils often needing a, a kind of commercial aspect to them, and they want a scale in terms of a capability of things like banners that work at a very simple level. If there's no content, it's got kind of the appropriate kind of content to work as your sort of basic space backdrop. But it's also got that capability to add richer content if it's relevant and respond to the different types of views on tablets and, and mobile. Um, this is some work we've done with also just recently we've developed a, a sort of a tiled system of cultural references of uh, 100 trays that they're often known for and it gives them the ability to to work to different audiences so if it's about working with young people fostering uh, with children you've got a, a richness there and we can bring in different types of content or if we're actually hosting a museum site within the council's website we can also kind of accommodate for some of the more unique requirements. And some of that we we're also building into some of the coded systems. So we've developed a coded library using Bootstrap. So it's a, a sort of open source um, technical framework 
um, but we're actually building in that capability so that, come back to my point, that not everyone's a designer, but we can have teams that can design. So if we can provide a design system with the ability to have those choices, um, then it allows that design to be more flexible for more people to be involved with it. So as I, I sort of come to the end of my speech in a sort of uh, Jerry Springer moment, I suppose, the a sort of summary of humanizing design, it's about firstly building better relationships, better relationships with the people involved in those sort of counselors, staff, and, and the relationship with the, the community as a whole. It's about showing that empathy through the way you meet their needs, providing digital spaces that actually engage their senses, their sense of belonging, um, their sense of purpose, um, and that sense of listening to, 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 to the residents. And I think it's about providing consistency. It's about recognizing that what good experience should be shared across your services and therefore services are consistently accessible. They are inclusive and therefore the kind of collective experiences, everyone in your, your community should be able to see themselves in the services you offer and see that sense of, of responsibility um, that I think every kind of local authority will, will believe that they have that sort of empathy and responsibility to serve their community. And I, and I kind of ending quote uh, from Don Norman, um, you know, we must design for the way people behave, not the way we would wish them to behave. And that's often a, a sort of trait. Sometimes the design is I want it to look like this because I, I like it. But I think in the cycle of humanized design, we want to understand what are people's needs and how can we how can we respond to those needs um, so that we can create a, a better relationship um, between local authority and um, and their users? So Henry, that's my end of the speak. Have we have we had some questions come in? Cool. Thank you very much, Will. So much so much useful information in there. Um, yeah, for everyone watching, please do submit your questions um, using the Q&A function. Um, it's really nice to see you all um, saying hello to each other in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, I think whilst we're kind of waiting for some questions to come in, Will, I mean, I mean, it'd be great to understand kind of what the common challenges you've seen for kind of local government organisations in kind of taking these kind of, I suppose, more, more creative approaches. I, I think a lot of the time, um... And again, this is sort of an agency interesting perspective. Sometimes we can, um, a lot of councillors can quite quickly engage with the right key stakeholders to get a project up and running and challenge some of the big issues. I think the biggest difficulty is often putting them into practice. Um, so I think it's sort of creating templates and content and, and guidelines is, is manageable. I think sharing that with hundreds of editors and service designers and understanding how to localize the um, that, that guidance into specific services, that's often the big challenge. So I, I absolutely empathize with the, the different councils and local government where, you know, you've got 30,000 pages and a new system. How do I get all those pages? And often the, the first response is don't, don't put all of those pages into the system. It's often a case of um, improving a process of evaluating the content in the different service sections looking at the information architecture, looking at applying a lot of what I've talked about, but in principle to that localized area. Um, and that does require a little bit of probably additional support um, training. Um, and so I think, I think the reality of applying these principles in practice requires probably more uh, governance and training and support than perhaps sometimes people expect. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that have kind of started to come in. Um, so first question um, uh, from, a, from, an, from an anonymous attendee. Um, <laughs> how, um, how do you ensure that when you leave the client, um, when the project is finished, that a user-centered design mindset is instilled? Uh, I think, well, it's trust to some degree. I know it's not my responsibility to hold them accountable, but, um, but I think it is about, I would say it starts a lot earlier than people think. I think this sort of concept of transparency is really important from the very earliest stages of, um, of that design process. Um, I think sometimes in the past, you know, years ago, we used to sort of used to be magic reveal moments. And I think we're way past that. We need to be 
uh, much more transparent, both with the community and, and your stakeholders. Um, I think you want to help the process educate people as and how they need as you go through it. So really, yes, there's a handover and yes, there's a what do you need to help continue this? But hopefully that process of education and bringing people on board starts much, much earlier. Um, but equally, um, I think it's important where you have designed systems, resources, guidelines is to document them in a way that is much more accessible. So we're trying to look at lots more ways to provide digital kind of cloud-based type documentation that becomes almost like a site that you can access. Um, and certainly in some of the we work with Cornwall actually, and they wrote, they wrote a blog whilst they were going through the process of evaluating their design. So it's a combination, I think, of being more transparent upfront and then trying to build up a kind of living and breathing set of guidelines um, as you come to a completion of, of a phase. Awesome, thank you very much. So uh, next question um, from Ben. Um, uh, how do you overcome resistance um, by higher level employees of local government? Often that, that yes, that provides, there's often challenges. I think um, with change, you get challenge. There's friction. And I think sometimes it's about understanding a little bit more localized uh, context. Um, so sometimes it might require a, a kind of detour of focus uh, where you need to apply the principles you're talking about, maybe to the area um, that someone might be challenging, you know, that's, um, you know, you might find there's someone in a particular department and they have particular challenges and it's worth understanding them a little bit better. And uh, certainly I would say the one thing I probably always underestimate is the amount of ways of prototyping examples to some degree to satisfy that discussion. Um, so often we might hypothetically say, well, we're going to build five or six templates and we'll demonstrate in five or six ways. We end up doing 50 or 40 type of examples to really practice and test different scenarios through those templates. And I think by demonstrating it in these sort of prototype concept levels helps build, it's part of the process of building um, and, and sort of working with the challenges you might meet. Thank you. Um, so next question uh, from Jason. Um, how difficult is it to retain design patterns which have had a lot of testing, um, uh, et cetera, in place and still maintain individuality uh, as you mentioned that local need? Yeah, I think this is, uh, it's like design architecture. You know, they're, they're very similar. You know, they're sort of, if you look at a, a sort of civic building, it has large structures. Um, that are difficult to change probably, but within it, you can localize it. Um, I think that does require sometimes a bit of a design strategy up front to understand which areas are you gonna have as, as sort of um, solid and, and fairly centrally managed perhaps, and then which bits are, are, are managed at a more local level. Uh, that again, there are dependencies here in terms of, it depends on the range, the sort of, uh, that there's an element of when you're designing the, the sort of architecture of templates, um, it's understanding what flexibility you, you want to sort of provide um, some of the local services. So there is a balance of being able to plan for that. And then it becomes down to sometimes the way the content management system is configured. Um, so some, again, I'm sort of hesitating now because often that becomes a, an overlap with a handover where you provide a design system and components and logic that, again, the internal team might take on board to configure. Um, so I think it requires a bit more open mindedness about how to manage things in the future. And again, that's feeds into the cycle to sort of um, how do we want people to manage it? That should be a need that's brought into the design uh, of the solution. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we've got one, one more question. Um, it's another anonymous one. Um, uh, how would you suggest approaching uh, deconstructing a bloated old process um, or processes set by a committee and redesigning it to please all stakeholders? Um, I, I suppose the main thing is then looking at what you're trying to achieve. One would be the quality of your output and the effectiveness of it. And then another really powerful one is efficiencies. What's the cost of doing it the way you're doing it? And if the way you do it has a detrimental impact on the quality, 
then that has a cost and there's a cost in that process. So I think it's trying to be quite um, principled um, about how you evaluate that process and then to be quite transparent about how you show that and share that. Um, if we can, if you can kind of agree in these sometimes political spaces, if we can agree a set of principles that we all agree to, then we can apply those principles and, and you've got a better grounds to be a bit more um, focused on trying to do something based on, on value rather than opinion. Hope that helps. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much. Well, I think that's, uh, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you. That was, that was very I said, yeah, so much, so much useful information there. Um, thanks everyone for watching. Um, we'll be back with another webinar um, next month um, and also World uh, Information Architecture Day Bristol. Um, uh, we'll be we'll be tweeting out um, our details of how to register for those um, uh, I think now so um so yeah please please do join us then um, uh, yeah I think I think that's that's just about it um, thank you very much Will thank you. Uh, yeah thank we'll you see everyone for next time listening. thanks very much then bye bye I finished